We've been going through this series called The Best News Ever. Say best news ever. All right, and we're in part two of uh, a two-part message uh, called Each One Reach One. Say each one reach one. All right, we're in Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. I'm just going to jump right in, not do uh, a whole lot of review. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, though, we would love to give you a Bible because we'd love to have you following along so that once the scripture's off the screen, you still got it in your hand. So if you'd like a Bible, raise your hand and Ivan will bring you one. Uh, we got one right down here. All right, so I'm over there. All right, so... Turn to Romans chapter 13 if you're new to the Bible. We've got a couple more down here. All right, so if uh, you're new to the Bible, have someone next to you show you where Romans is. It's about, two, uh, about three quarters of the way in, or there's a table of contents in the front. We'll read, let's read Romans 13, verses 8 through 14 together. Romans 13, verses 8, we're going to read through the, the rest of the chapter. It says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. That's where we stopped last week. We're going to start uh, this week right here where it says, So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual, sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires." So here, to, here we go. How can you reach the people in your sphere? Last week, we looked at the first three components of this acronym. The R stood for recognize your debt. And that was the debt to love. And remember that the recognizing the debt comes from receiving and realizing how profoundly we've been loved in Christ. It's, it's not an obligation that comes from ourselves. It's that we've been given so much love in Jesus that we're obligated to pass that along to everybody else. It's like if you were in the middle of the desert and you had a sparkless water truck and you came across 50 people who were dying of thirst, what would you have? you'd have an obligation to share that life-giving water because you've got way more than you need. And that's the love that we have in Christ. We, have a, we need to recognize our debt to love those in our sphere. The E stood for embody love. And that was to have a life that just resonates and overflows with the love of God. And then the A was to awaken a sense of urgency. And we live in a culture that's constantly trying to numb us and, and lull us to sleep and inactivity and mediocrity and distracted by all these things that don't matter for eternity. And so Paul says, if you really want to reach your sphere, you got to awaken this sense of urgency that the, the and he says, the, the, the night's far gone, the day's at hand, and it's, we're running out of time to make a difference in the lives that those, of those that God has put in our sphere. So now we get to the sea. And the sea is one of my favorite parts of this whole passage. And we're going to call this contend for souls. Say contend. Yeah. Right? Contend is a, a word that starts with C. I wanted to put fight or war, but the, I couldn't. The word for, so it's contend. It's this idea of fighting for souls. And if, you're, if you don't have this mindset, you're not going to be motivated to reach your sphere. 
And here's the verse where that comes out of. It says, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And so here we start with this idea of casting off. How do we contend for souls? Well, first we have to cast off works of darkness. The word cast off here simply means to discard something, to actively get rid of it. Works of darkness are things that people do in dark, in secret, right? So anybody ever been to a, a club, ever been out clubbing? Don't raise your hand. Um, in a past life, right? What are, you know, if you ever go to a bar or a club, what are they always? Dark, dark right? No bad deal has ever been done in a bright alley. Uh, it's always done in a dark alley. Things are, bad things are always done in the dark. And that's what Paul's talking about here. It's, a, it's one of the reasons why I've never understood the rationale for making church sanctuaries dark. Uh, that's like what the world does when it goes out clubbing. That's why we have the lights on during worship. We got the doors open, the sunshine streaming in, because we're people of the light. We're not people who are ashamed to worship God. We're not people who are ashamed to see us raise our hands or hear our voices uh, offering God the glory that he's due. And so Paul says, let's cast off these works of darkness. And I love this verse from Hebrews. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's do what? Lay aside or cast off every weight and the sin that so easily clings to us so closely. And let's run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. I talk to a lot of, a lot of Christians, and, and they, they describe a life that, that kind of has this mindset, right? That if you can't fight for souls if you're fatigued with your own sin, fighting your own sin. And I think the devil wants us caught in these cycles of sin and failure so that we don't have any energy or any confidence to share the good news with other people. And their lives look uh, kind of like this. Anybody ever feel like this? Like you're just walking around loaded down with guilt and you're just hoping to make it to the end of the day. You're not hoping to do anything spectacular. And Paul says, let's just cast all that off. Just dump all that weight of sin. We've got something much better to do with our time and our resources. So we've got to cast off the works of darkness. But then he says, put on the armor of light. The second thing we need to do is put on this armor. And I, I love the word armor here in the Greek. It actually doesn't mean like a suit of armor. It's the Greek word for instruments of war, for weapons. Uh, it's the broad category of things that you use when you wage war. And it's this idea of doing battle. Put on the things necessary to go and do battle. So shed all the things that are keeping you from the fight and put on the things that will give you confidence for the fight. This makes sense? All right. Um, and so as we, we put on, wrap ourselves, sink into these instruments of war, the question for us is what are you wrapping your life with? What are you sinking into? What are you equipping yourself with? Parents, you need to really think about what you're wrapping your kids' lives in. Are you more concerned with their education or their salvation? Are you more concerned about their friends or that they have a relationship with God? Are you more concerned that they'll grow up and have a good income? Or are you more concerned that they grow up and understand their inheritance in Christ? What are you wrapping your life in? What are you wrapping your kids' lives, your friends' lives in? Works of darkness or weapons of light? Are you living like you're on vacation or on a mission? This is the real question we have to wrestle with. Am I living like I'm on vacation, like I'm here to get the maximum enjoyment out of this season that I'm here? 
where I'm supposed to accumulate as much comfort and convenience and luxury as I possibly can in the short time that I'm here, or am I living like I've been sent on a mission by God to accomplish something with eternal stakes? This is not vacation, according to Paul. This is war. What does that mean for us practically? We are fighting a spiritual battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Do you think like you're fighting a spiritual war? Did you get up this morning realizing you're at war, you are not on vacation? We are fighting in this war for the souls of those in our sphere. That's your mission. God, we talked about that last week. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go back and listen to that part of the message that God has given each one of us a, a unique sphere of influence. You realize no one on the planet has your sphere. No one in history has had your sphere. God has placed you in a unique moment in time, in a unique geographic location, and he's surrounded you with people whose souls are on the line. Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Peter said, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, think about this. You dads, if you were out watching a group of kids playing at a playground and you saw a rabid pit bull foaming at the mouth wander into the playground, what would you do? Do you just sit there and watch and go, oh, this ought to be interesting. At least my kid's quick. Right? Is that how you would approach it? Is, but think about it. Is that how we're approaching our sphere? Are we just sitting and watching the devil destroy the lives of go those God has put in our sphere, predetermined that we should be available to be an example of Jesus to? Are you going to just sit and watch or are you going to stand up? And fight. Anybody want to stand up and fight? Well, let's, let's talk about how. How do we do it? How do we stand up and fight? What are our weapons? Now, I'm going to go a little bit outside of Romans here into Ephesians. I'm still dealing with the same author, but Paul gives us a full list uh, of the, the weapons that are at our disposal here in Ephesians 6. Uh, and let me read these to you. It says, put on the whole armor of God or get all the weapons of war from God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Stand therefore, having put on the belt, fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having put on, and for, as for shoes, having put on the readiness given by the, pe the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times, in the Holy Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, and also for me, that words may be given me in opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the best news ever. It doesn't say that. That's my version. And so I want to I take a look at the weapons, the armor of God. I want to look at it in a modern context, because we don't have shields and swords anymore. And so I want to kind of do a modern take on the armor of God. And so it starts off with the belt of truth. The belt of truth. And the idea here is this, if you know a, 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 what they call it a battle belt of truth, 
You know a battle belt, it's designed for combat. It's thicker, it's stronger, it's heavier. Uh, it's got ways to attach a lot of gear to it so that the soldier, the marine, the operator, whoever is using it has quick access to their gear and they're, they're not losing stuff in the heat of battle. It's not falling off. And so this represents for us, the battle belt of truth represents a strong biblical worldview. Everything hangs on your worldview. God wants you to have a worldview based on biblical truth that will give you key uh, access to principles that you need for this fight. Keeps you from getting caught with your intellectual pants around your ankles in the heat of battle. When you're sharing your faith and someone's asking you a question, if you don't have a biblical belt of, battle belt of truth in the middle of that fight, you're going to find your pants at your ankles. That's not where you want to be on the battlefield. And so Paul says, put on this belt of truth. The next piece of armor that we're given is this, what I'm calling the tactical vest of righteousness. All right? A tactical vest has a unique purpose uh, it provides both protection and a way to distribute the weight of additional gear. This is the purpose of a tactical vest. And this is, represents being covered tactically with Christ's righteousness. And the way this works is that righteousness received by faith, not from our own effort, guards our soul against temptation, pride, and weariness. And it does this because since it's Christ's righteousness that I've put on, not my own righteousness, I can't take credit for the righteousness. So that tactical vest, it protects me from pride because I recognize this isn't my vest, this is Jesus's. It also means I'm not going to, it helps us not compromise, it protects us from temptation, and it also lightens the weight of trying to live a righteous life. Right, Because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He means take his righteousness received by faith. If you live in the righteousness of Christ by faith, that's easy, that's light. You try to live in your own righteousness through self-effort and self-will. Anybody ever try that? It right, doesn't last, last very long. That's difficult. That's a heavy, impossible burden to carry. So belt, battle belt of truth, your tactical vest of righteousness. The third piece of armor that he tells us to, to gear up with is what I'm calling combat boots of readiness. Right? And so combat boots are an essential part of gear. They provide stability, readiness for action, and they give confidence to venture into rough terrain. And notice it's the combat boots of readiness that comes from being prepared with the gospel of peace. And so this represents pre being prepared to share. Turn to someone and say, you should prepare to share. If you're not prepared to share, you're going out into battle barefoot. Do you realize that? If you don't know how to share the gospel, when the opportunity comes, you're going to be like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Uh, maybe we should go call George. You know, uh, he's got his boots laced up and ready. Are you prepared to share the best news ever? Are you prepared with a solid understanding of the gospel? If I asked you, what are the seven key points of the gospel? Could you rip them off? Now, I'm not expecting you to at this point. We've been spending a lot of time going through the best news ever, giving the big picture. We're going to print up a little tool for you to have in your wallet that's got the gospel, the best news, the key points laid out for you so that you can be equipped to have that. Are you ready to step out and share with everyone in your sphere? Are you ready today? That if somebody calls you up, a friend calls you up, Think, I want everybody to think about their friend that's the farthest from God that you know. We all have them. Somebody got, have you got it? That person's in your head, like God-hater person. Everybody got that person? Just living for themselves. What if that person called you up in an hour and said, 
I just had a dream. I was taking a nap. I woke up from a dream. I saw a guy. He said, I'm Jesus. Call your friend and ask them how to be saved. Could you deliver? Are you ready? If your farthest from God friend called you and said, I want to be saved, help me. Are you prepared for that? Are you equipped to lead someone in a prayer of salvation? Are you confident to keep moving forward when things get rocky and conversations get thorny? Or the minute it gets a little, ah, uh, you're like, I'm out. Gravel, I'm in my bare feet, right? Not treading on that. Not going to step on any thorns with this person because I'm not prepared. Paul says if you're going to do battle, you got to get ready to step out and share your faith. You've got to get ready to do that. The next part of the, of the armor that Paul wants us to gear up with, I'm calling the ballistic plates of faith. Now, this is different from your, your tactical vest of righteousness. Those can stop small arms fire. All right, the ballistic plates are there to protect what they call the cardiac box from rifle rounds that are shot at a distance. They're actual hard ceramic plates that get inserted uh, in that vest, in that carrier. And they stop these bigger rounds, the 5.56 five, rounds. 90% of gunshot wounds to the cardiac box are fatal. And so any operator, any soldier going into combat knows if I don't have my ballistic plates of faith guarding my cardiac box, if I get hit, I'm a goner. Are you protected? This represents a bulletproof faith in God. Do you have a bulletproof faith in God? Protected by faith in God's goodness and his sovereignty. Whatever the devil fires at you, are you confident that God's still good and God is still in control? Or do you waver and doubt and wonder and question if God loves you, if, if you're saved, if life matters? Or do you get taken out? Are you vulnerable to those long shot, unexpected shots to the heart from the devil? We're not supposed to be trusting in our own feelings or worldly wisdom. You don't have to understand everything to trust God. You don't have to feel good about everything to still trust God. Life can be hard. Life can be devastating. Things can come at you from way out of the blue that you weren't expecting and cause you to lose your business or lose a loved one or lose your, your, you know, your marriage. Things can come from out of nowhere aimed right at your heart. You don't have to be a fatality in your faith. You can still trust without understanding why. I found, and I found that people who have their ballistic plates of faith tucked in their vest of righteousness, when tragedy comes, they don't question why. They say, thank you, God, that you're still good. Thank you that you're sovereign. Even though I don't get it, and this is hard, the devil can't take me out with this. I trust you. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Are you protected from Satan's sniper rounds of doubt, discouragement, distraction, and division? Are you protected? Or if he took aim at you today, you'd be a casualty. Paul says, gear up, get ready, be strong, be ready to go into combat. The next one he says for us is the helmet of salvation. This is critical. It protects the, the brain from blunt force trauma 
and it protects the vision and keeps debris out of your eyes. This represents an eternity mindset, right, where we're protected, our brains, our thinking are protected from the blunt force trauma of cultural messaging about false priorities. Do you realize your head is getting bombarded pounded every day. Satan is walking. If you turn on the television, you get on social media, you Google something, and Satan's like, whack, with messaging about things that don't matter, but seem critical. If you don't have your helmet on, you're going to get spiritually concussed, and you're going to start hallucinating. And you're going to think things matter that have no bearing on eternity at all. So, is your vision clear about your mission? An eternity mindset keeps it clear. If you think about your kids, think about your grandkids through an eternity mindset, what really matters? Are you putting more effort into their sports experience than their spiritual experience? Has debris gotten in your eyes? Have you been concussed by the culture and you've lost sight of what really matters? Reminds us, a helmet of salvation, this eternity mindset, reminds us of what really matters, and that's the salvation of those in your sphere. Has the smoke, the dust, the debris of battle clouded your vision? Have you lost sight of those that are out there and vulnerable that God's given you the opportunity to help save? Second to last one, the, the, I'm calling this the M4 of the Spirit. All right? M4 is the primary weapon of a soldier, a marine, an operator. It's powerful. The more ammo they carry, the greater ability they have to fight. You know what, the, what they, they call the, how, many, how many rounds the average soldier carries? Anybody know? Not 500. So basic combat load is 210. It's seven magazines with 30 rounds in a mag. All right, so 210. So that's a lot of shots you get to take if you're an equipped uh, soldier marine operator. Now, more practice you take, what do you get? Better accuracy. I have a friend that was a Master Chief Navy SEAL sniper, and he said he could take the, the ball off a flagpole. Uh, I don't, I don't want to... I think he said 1,000 meters. Is that about right? No? Too far? That's pretty far. Maybe it's 500 meters? Is that more likely? Sniper. Seal sniper. And uh, I asked him, I said, Darren, how'd you get so good? And he said, over the course of 20 years in the SEALs, I have literally shot over a million rounds. How do you get that good? What does it take? A lot of practice. So what does that look like for us spiritually? This is spirit-empowered scripture, right? Second Corinthians says we don't fight with, uh, we use godly, God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. When you get around friends that have ideas, false concepts, worldly thinking, do you know the scripture that can shoot that down? If you know it, are you good enough to take a shot at it? Or do you get in conversations and you just you fall, you walk away feeling like you got shot? And the devil took you out. A lot of people, can I borrow your Bible for a second? A lot of people will carry, a lot of Christians will carry a Bible, but they never memorize the scripture. What's that like? That's like a, a Marine carrying an M4 without any ammo. 
you got it, looks good, looks impressive, but you can't shoot anything out of it because you don't know anything. Memorizing scripture is the way you load your mags. I had this idea as I was prepping. I was like, I'm going to put together 210 verses in seven categories of life that are essential for understanding how to fight this battle and how to save souls. So I'm going to do that over the next couple of weeks. Because uh, I remember uh, like talking with Peter. He's, he's getting married soon to the most amazing girl uh, that he's ever brought. And I said, do you have 20 husband verses that will govern and guard you and make you a biblical husband? He's like, I'm going to. <laughs> right? I'm like, okay, start loading that mag so that when the devil comes and tries to ruin your marriage, you've got something to fight with. Instead of just standing there going, uh, and getting peppered. All right, study, meditate on the scriptures. Those that are coming on Wednesdays, you're, you're loading ma your magazines with biblical truth that you can use to tear down these arguments. All right, last one. I'm calling this the combat comms. All right, this is uh, essential in battle that you stay connected. It's a two-way connection, two-way communication that lets you stay in contact with command, receive, air support if you need it, and coordinate with fellow soldiers. Uh, work, the Bible calls this prayer and petition. Okay? If you're not in prayer, it's, it's how we receive guidance from command. It's how we get our marching orders from the Lord. It's how we call in prayer, air support. Get it? Air support, prayer support. All right, that's good. You like that? All right. If you're not in prayer, you, you're, you're like your radio's out. You don't have any opportunity when you're getting overwhelmed to call in support. The guys that come on uh, 0530 man prayer, they know that. They experience that. I've got, I don't have to fight this battle alone. I've got support coming, being launched in from fellow uh, operators who are there to help me. And it's what keeps us unified and able to support each other in time of need. What do we always say at the end of a prayer? Amen. What does amen mean? Amen. I agree. I agree. I used, to, I used to struggle with this a lot about, uh, I went through a season where I was like, what's the point of prayer if God already knows everything? Right? I'm not informing him. He's already promised to give me everything I need for life and godliness, why should I ask for things if he already knows? And I realized one of the reasons is because prayer is what unifies us. Prayer is what gets all of us on the same page with what God's already willing to do. It gets us aligned in this combat. So how do you reach your sphere? Remember, what was R? I already did it. <laughs> Recognize your debt. What's A? Or E? Sorry. Embody love, A. Awaken awareness, C. Contend for souls. Hopefully I drove that home. Contend for souls. H stands for have Jesus habits. And let's wrap up with this. Have Jesus habits. Let's walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. All right. How do you have Jesus' habits? Paul says walk properly. This, I love this word walk in the Greek because it means a repetitive behavior that leads somewhere. That's what the word walk is. It's not a step. It's a walk. It's a repetitive behavior that causes you to end up somewhere. Right? It, habits are routines or practices that are performed regularly. It's an automatic response to a specific situation. And he says, do this properly. Right? With good form or appearance, a good witness. Do it as in the day. Realize that everybody in your sphere is watching you. Do you know that? Everybody in your sphere is watching your life. And so 
we need to cultivate good habits that lead to a good witness. This is one of the key ways that we reach our sphere. And then he goes on, and he says, not only do we need to walk properly, but we need to not walk in certain things. And he gives us three three groups. He says orgies, which is excessive partying, drunkenness, which means to be under the influence of alcohol, pot, drugs, uh, whatever. Then it's sexual immorality and sensuality. Don't have those habits. And then he says quarreling and jealousy. This is one of our favorite ones in the church. People love to quarrel and, and, and compare and envy, uh, kind of so, the digital social media culture has created that phenomenon. And so the idea here is we need to not just cultivate good habits, we need to get rid of destructive habits that lead to a bad witness. Now, here's the idea. If you change your habits, you change your life. And that'll lead to a better witness. You change your habits, you'll change your life, and that'll lead to a better witness. So understand how habits get formed. There's something called a habit formation loop, and it starts with your identity, how you view yourself, how you think of yourself, and how you think of yourself will will direct your behavior, what you do. So if you think of yourself as I'm a shy person. You walk into church, what are you going to do? But what behavior does that look like? You'll isolate. You'll go sit by yourself and you'll sit there with your head down, looking in your phone, hoping somebody will come up and talk to you. You won't because what are you? Shy. If you see yourself as an outgoing, friendly person, what are you going to do? You're going to walk up and start talking to people. That's, your identity directs your behavior. Our behavior is what leads to a reward or a negative consequence. Habits never form off of negative consequences, so we're just going to focus on the reward. We do something that results in something that's pleasurable, like, ooh, that was good. I like that, right? That was, I got a reward from that. That, later on, that reward will serve as a cue to your brain to, when it sees an opportunity to experience that pleasure again. All right? So if you walked into church and you talked with someone and they gave you $100, and said, hey, I, wanna, now I just feel like being generous today. Here's 100 bucks. What are you going to do when you come to church next week and see that person? Your brain's going to go, cue, go talk to them. Maybe they have another $100. Maybe they're feeling generous again. All right, And so what the cue does is it leads to a craving. And a craving is an anticipation of, an, of the reward again. All right, So your brain's like, oh, $100, I want that. And so you start to have this craving. That craving leads to the behavior again. That makes sense? If that happens over and over again, the behavior turns into a routine. Then it's a habit. Once it's a routine, the routine now starts to reaffirm your identity. So this is how habits work, and that's why they're so essential to understand in reaching our sphere because we have to understand how they're formed in order to change them. So changing your habits starts by changing your identity. How you view yourself because the only part of the loop that we can change is the behavior. And so here's what Paul says. How do we cultivate Jesus' habits? It starts by putting on the Lord Jesus. We looked at this word put on before means to sink into, to to wrap yourself with. It's this idea of um, putting, of fully identifying with who Jesus is and immersing ourselves into that. It means to take on a whole new identity based on Jesus. 
This, if I can change how I think about myself, it'll change how I start to behave. Now, imagine that you come up to two different people, uh, one that's uh, trying to quit smoking and one who's never smoked, and you offer them a cigarette. The first guy is going to say, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. What's his identity? I'm a smoker who's trying to quit. You ask me, I've never touched a burning cigarette before. If you ask me, do you want a cigarette, what am I going to say? I'm not a smoker. Not I don't smoke, I'm not a smoker. It's not my identity. It's not any part of my makeup. It has never been a part of my makeup. And so my behavior would never accept that. That makes sense? And so if you think of yourself as someone who struggles with sin, the devil says, oh, say you struggle with pornography, and the devil says, oh, hey, do you want to lust online? What are you going to say? No, I'm trying to quit. What does that say about you? You see yourself as someone who struggles with that sin. Versus someone whom Christ has set free from sin. And your behavior is going to be off. You're never going to break that habit because you're not changing how you view yourself uh, in the first place. What do you have yourself wrapped in? Do you see yourself through the lens of Jesus? Or do you see yourself through the lens of the culture? And then just for kicks, how do those in your sphere see you? Do your your sphere see you like Jesus, or did they see you as someone just like them? Is this how you see yourself? In Ephesians, those that were coming on Wednesdays, this is what we learned about who we are in Christ. We're chosen by God before time began. That means... That if you understand that, there, you know that God doesn't choose in time. There was never a time that God didn't want you. What kind of a thought is that? Is that like just a blow your mind thought that there was never a time that God didn't want you? Because he chose you before time. All right? You're holy and blameless. You're loved by God. You're you're predestined to be his child. You're fully accepted in the beloved. You're completely forgiven of all your sins. You know the mystery of his will. You're given an eternal inheritance. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing your inheritance. And you have God's resurrection power working in your life. Is this how you see yourself? When you get up in the morning, when you look in the mirror, is this who you see As someone who is more than a conqueror in Christ that's forever been loved by God, that in Christ is forgiven and free, is this how you see yourself? Some do, right? Those that don't, if that doesn't resonate with you, you need an identity upgrade, okay? And he says, make no provision for the flesh. Provision means to think ahead, advanced planning. If I see myself as in Jesus, I'm going to start living like Jesus. And I'm, instead of giving an oppor- looking for opportunities to gratify myself, I'm going to start looking for how I can glorify Jesus. So I want to end with this thought. There are two types of mentalities among Christians. First one I'm calling a cruise ship mentality. Cruise ship mentality. You show up to church and you're on vacation expecting to be well fed. You expect me to have put a lot of time and effort into this. All right. and you're not going to cook. You're not going to shop. You expect to be well fed. You expect to be entertained. You expect Jared to put a lot of work into it. You expect the music to be right on and everybody in harmony and nobody making any mistakes. You expect to be served by others. Never thought about getting out there 
You wonder why some people leave five minutes before the end of service because they're going out there to serve you lunch. And you expect to be comfortable and relaxed. Imagine if we didn't have air conditioning and it was 110 degrees in here. Would you still come? The other mentality I'm calling a warship mentality. You're on a warship, you're on a mission. And you're expecting to get equipped. You're expecting to make sacrifices. You're expecting to serve as a team. And you're expecting to defeat the enemy. What mentality did you bring today? Did you, are you here to save souls? Are you just here for the selfie? It's an honest question. And one I'd really like you to ask yourself. Am I here to save souls? Or am I just here for the selfie? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the challenge of it to us today. And I pray that we would take it to heart, that your Holy Spirit would cause the light bulbs to go on in our head, that we would change our whole mindset. We would get equipped. We would contend for souls, and we'd uh, look to, to have Jesus' habits in our life. Father, would you uh, do something deep and permanent and profound in our hearts? And we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just one last thing uh, before I let you go for lunch. Um, Man Monday's tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be at Jim's house. Uh, I encourage you to come, guys. We're going to talk about practically how to actually change our habits. Uh, so I encourage you to come out for that. We're actually going to go through the mechanics of actually changing habits, how you can literally change God, how God has designed you to change the habits in your life. Um, and then uh, we got prayer in the morning, guys. Um, again, this is how you see yourself. I can't tell you how many guys I've said, hey, come to man prayer. And they're like, oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, change that identity because Jesus was. He got up early before dawn to pray. Do you want to be like Jesus? Are you wrapping yourself in Jesus or are you wrapping yourself in cultural excuses? All right? All right. God bless you guys.